My youngest son, Charlie, learned to swim at the same time as he learned to walk. He loved the water. His three older siblings also loved to swim. Sam was six, Lucy was five, Willie was three. Charlie often followed them into the big pool when the other toddlers were still in the baby pool. The summer Charlie turned one, he followed his brother Willie to the diving board at the country club. It was a sunny July day in Indiana where all my kids were born. Willie walked to the end of the board and yelled, watch me mama, as he jumped in the pool and then swam to the wall. Then Charlie climbed up the two steps of the ladder and walked towards the end of the board. I was treading water in the deep end, waiting to see what Charlie would do once he re reached the end of the long board. The lifeguard looked over, concerned. So did all the parents. When his tiny toes reached the edge, Charlie stopped. Everyone at the pool was now paying attention. And Charlie looked around to make sure his brother Willie was paying att attention. With four feet of a perfect summer day between us, I said, Charlie, if you jump, if you need me, I'll be right here to catch you. And within a breath, he shouted, watch me, mama. And he launched himself into the sky, smiling as his tiny body arced towards the pool. As he floated through the air, I used my hands to quickly propel myself backwards so he didn't land on me. He hit the pool feet first, and then his body followed and dropped below the surface. I ducked underwater and watched him sink. Just when I thought I needed to reach for him, he turned towards the sun and kicked. He intuitively knew to turn his head and heart towards the light. We broke the surface together. Charlie looked around with a big smile as everyone cheered for him. Over 20 years later, Charlie's daughters, Sonny and Ray, learned to swim at the pool at my home in Northern California. The previous summer, I needed to be with them uh, when they swim, but last summer, they were both going off the diving board and swimming the length of the pool on their own. Sonny was five and Ray was four. Watch me, go, go, watch me, they said over and over again that summer. It was the summer of their biggest jumps and longest swims. It was also the summer their dad died. Charlie was 27 and one of the 200 people a day in the US dying from fentanyl laced drugs. Charlie was fearless as a child, rebellious as a teenager, and reckless as a young adult. Charlie also carried the pain of our divorce when he was four, abuse against his body when he was a teenager, the betrayals of trusted adults, along with unhealed generational trauma. When it didn't seem like his family was cheering him on anymore, he turned to alcohol and drugs. During the times when he was struggling, when he needed our attention and compassion the most, we were told that tough love was better. Don't take his calls. Let him hit rock bottom. Let him learn a lesson. Don't watch him. Tough love is supposed to treat, uh, teach boundaries, resilience, and independence. Instead, it showed Charlie that we weren't there for him during the moments when he needed us the most. He left early or ran away from every rehab he was sent to as a teenager. The experts told us to continue with tough love, which caused even more estrangement with some of the family. In his 20s, by the time he became a father, Charlie had a hard time letting people who loved him in. Unhealed trauma doesn't like to be touched. When Charlie couldn't trust that anyone would be waiting for him in the deep end, he jumped and he let himself sink deeper. Charlie's rock bottom was death. He died alone in a Sacramento hotel room. He'd been trying to detox on his own so he could show up for his girls and reconnect with his family in Indiana. One of his last messages to me was, I just miss my family. A few weeks after her dad died, Sunny intentionally started yelling for help in the pool. She swam to the deep end and then looked right at me and called for help. My first urge was to swim to her to save her. 
And instead I said, Sonny, I'm right here, but you can save yourself. You know how to swim. She flailed and dunked her head underwater, and when she resurfaced, she reached an arm towards the sky for added drama and yelled, go, go, help me. Without moving to her, I said, you can save yourself, Sonny. You can swim to the wall, or if you're tired, you can roll on your back. I'm here if you need me, but you can save yourself. She dunked herself a few more times. I slowly moved a little closer. I'm right here, Sonny, but you can save yourself. You know how to swim. You know how to do this. Finally, she smiled and swam to me. She saved herself. When Charlie died, I received messages from all over the world, some from people who knew him, many from people who read my stories about his life and death on social media. There was the collective ache in the messages, like we were all drowning in sorrow for Charlie or for someone we loved like Charlie, who we didn't know how to help. We needed someone to save us, to throw us a life raft. I even wanted someone to save me from the heartache of losing Charlie. I can't do this, I thought. I can't go on, it's too painful. And then I remembered, I can save myself, we can save ourselves, especially when we know someone is nearby to listen and to witness our hard moment instead of dismissing it, and to hear our pain instead of judging it. Watch me. Instead of tough love, we need to practice connection. We need to offer compassion and understanding as a life preserver for our loved ones. Watch me. We need to let them know we believe in them, especially during the moments that they stop believing in themselves. We need to remind our loved ones that even on their worst days, they still matter. Watch me. We need to remind ourselves that we're all connected so we can reach for the wall or roll over or float for a while until we get our strength back. In the last moments of his life, before he reached for a drug, I wish Charlie had remembered to reach his head and heart towards the light and kick. Thank you.